Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. It is episode 124, June 23rd, 2019. I'm going to have guest John Moody on. We're going to chat about elderberry and uh, a few other things. But uh, you heard John on here before. He was on a few episodes ago, a couple months ago. And uh, we talked about uh, his book, uh, The Frugal Homesteader, and, and a few other things. And just had a great conversation with him. But, uh, yeah, you come back on. He's got another book out on elderberry, so we wanted to talk about that. And, um, yeah, it's a good conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. I actually uh, uh, recorded the call last week with him and um, just haven't had a chance to get it up. But I guess that throws us into the homestead updates. What's going on? Where have I been? I took a couple weeks off, and things are um, things have been real busy around here. First off, we've been hatching a lot of quail, really way too many quail. So I did a lot of quail processing and I think I've hatched uh, four batches out of the incubator, just one after another and just putting a lot in the freezer. I'm just trying to get the freezer stocked up with quail and, uh, you know, just trying to change some things out there. Got that done. We had some more uh, rabbit buns born on the homestead, but, you know, not without complications. One, about half of her, she had them on the, on the cage floor and you know, they had some exposure there before we got to them, but my wife found them and got some in the box, uh, got the uh, ones that were alive back in the nesting box. And the ones she put in the nesting box, she's actually taking care of and doing real well. So happy for that. I was worried she wouldn't take care of any of them because she had them on the wire. But And they were out there for a few hours before uh, we got to them. But that's been a couple weeks ago now, and they're doing really, really well. So I'm, I'm just kind of surprised that she, she took care of them. The big story around our homestead is rain, rain, and more rain. I mean, it's... It's uh, it's really causing me some some problems in the garden, just like it is a lot of people. And uh, you know, I mean, we have raised beds um, mostly, and and most of the garden is out of the water as far as standing water. But the reality is, just that much rain, it's just bringing on the blight for the tomatoes, and just it's just no stopping it. Right at this point, it's just so bad, and it just won't quit. It just comes down in buckets when it comes. So. It's going to be a bad year for tomatoes. It's looking like a horrible year for cucumbers, which has always been one of my best crops. Uh, Peppers don't look good. Uh, Fortunately, I have those things also in the greenhouse, so they're not really getting affected by the rain. I'm just not going to have as much of it because I'm limited on space in the greenhouse. There's only so much I can grow in there. But we are going to have some tomatoes and peppers uh, there. Lettuce is loving it. I mean, the, the lettuce is just loving all this water. I mean, I've never had a better lettuce crop. All the every place I have a lettuce, it's just blowing up. It's going crazy. The trees seem to be li- liking it a lot. The trees are looking really good. Bushes are doing fine with it. It's just just the garden, you know. It's really having a hard time uh, with all this rain. But I know a lot of folks are in the same uh, situation, and and uh, you know we'd complain if it wasn't raining at all. So it's just one or the other all the time. But yeah, it's really causing me some issues this year. It's just the garden's not going to be near as uh, beautiful and abundant as it usually is, that's for sure. The big story, other than the rain, is that uh, we bought the property next door to us. And if you're in our Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, you probably see me talking a little bit about this. It was a it was a really good deal. Um, that property is it's a vacant lot. It has a pole barn on it, a 30 by 50 pole barn, and um, a real nice shape. Uh, it was had a lot of trees and stuff growing up in the front of it. But um, I got all that cleaned up uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, and um, it's looking really, really good. I think we're going to be able to do a lot with that. It's got, you know, it's it's got a lot of lawn. The rest of the whole property is just nothing but lawn. And of course, you know me. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something with that, just not right away. We're kind of just take my time and and uh, you know just do some planning, some designing in my head, and getting down some paper and just kind of think this layout you know uh, out real well because the reality is you know there's some infrastructure to put in there's some fences and and you know perhaps um you know some trails and 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 walkways and things like that that i want to kind of 
maneuver through the property before we start plopping in the other things. So, um, yeah, there's just, I got to think it out a little bit. It's going to be a summer long process, just getting started with it, really just getting the infrastructure in. But yeah, I got a really good deal on it. It's going to be a nice addition to our property. And like I said, it's right next door. So we can just blend the two properties together. So it'll, it'll open up a lot of possibilities for our homestead. And then, so I'm looking forward to really jumping on that. Also, if you're part of the Homestead Forum membership community, which is our membership group for this podcast, go over and check it out. If you haven't been there in a couple weeks, if you haven't popped in in a couple weeks, go check it out. Uh, There are some really big changes. Things are a lot better over there. It's set up to be uh, way more of a social environment. And uh, I think you're really, really going to like the forum layout and the groups, the courses, everything that's in there is just flowing way better now. So go check that out if you're not part of that. And if you want to be part of it, just go to smalltownhomestead.com, go to membership in the uh menu bar at the top of the page there and check it out it's uh it's really cool there's a we got about 96 members in there right now and and i'm hope that we'll really grow that into a just a really booming community of uh, homesteading folks where there'll just be a just a, a lot of of knowledge floating around and you know just a place where especially if you're getting started homestead i think it's just going to end up being a really valuable resource uh, for folks like that so check that out if you want but if you're part of that already pop in and and uh, contribute to the forum and check out the flow of things it's looking really really good i've had to do a lot of updates there so that's what i've been doing that's what's been going on around this homestead and uh, it's been busy and uh, it has taken away from the podcast a little bit i like i said earlier i rec- i recorded this interview with john moody last weekend and i just haven't had a chance to get it up so uh today you're getting that and um, i think you're really really going to enjoy it John is a return guest who you also heard on episode 112. And uh, his backstory is, you can go back and listen to that episode if you didn't hear it, but he discovered more than a decade ago that uh, his diet was killing him. He had ulcers, he had seasonal seasonal allergies, he had some other health problems. So he and his family began to transition to local foods and local food distribution. And eventually he relocated his family to 35 acres of land to, to put his learning into practice. Um, he's the founder of Whole Life Buying Club. He also speaks at a lot of uh, local, regional, and national events on food, farming, and nutrition. He's the author of the Frugal Homesteader Handbook, and he has also written a book on elderberry that you'll be able to pre-order. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later in the episode. But with that, let's just jump right into this interview with uh, John Moody. Well, John, welcome back to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, friend. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing real well. It's always great to have you on. And uh, I know you just got so much going on that, uh, man, you could probably come on once a month and tell us about all the cool things you're doing because you're writing books and homesteading and just doing all kinds of cool stuff. It'd be fun. You know, or maybe, it, I don't know if your listeners will want, we could almost do like a, a question episode where they submit questions for us that yeah. you and I answer or give thoughts. Yeah, that'd so, be great sometime but, for sure. So. Yeah. So, what's going on on your homestead at the moment? Well, it's been uh, it's been crazy. Been hatching a lot of quail and birthing rabbits and trying to plant underwater and uh, just all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard that I'm rice farming is sweeping the Midwest this year. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, yeah, that's pretty good news. We we live on a pretty small lot, and uh, and uh, we're we're in the process right now of buying the lot right next to us, which will double the size of our property, and it's got a big old pole barn on it. Uh, so uh, we're going to be taking that over and got a real good deal on that, and should be closing on that here this next week, and uh, so that'll give me a, a lot more area to to plan a few things and just expand a few things. So that'll be good. Oh, that's fantastic! Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, thanks. But uh, yeah, you uh, now you've been busy writing. You just uh, popped out a couple more books here uh, just recently, and I figured maybe we could talk about one of them today. Yeah, you know, over winter, I we I did a book all about elderberry. Mm-hmm. Um, since elderberry is like, there's so much renewed interest in the plant. Which when I started like reading and studying about the elderberry, um, I, I was amazed at how we, like, lost track of this plant. Mm-hmm. Because, like, there's a quote by a uh, 16, 1600s British researcher, herbalist, physician guy by the name of John Evelyn, where he says, um, this is probably really close to the quote, but he said, if if only people understood how valuable the elder elder was, they would never have an injury or disease that they could not fetch a cure from every any any hedge in all of England. Wow, um, so that's quite the endorsement for a plant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, like um, 
you know, the elder is one of the few plants in all of human history that has entire books written just about this one plant. Mm. So there's this guy, his, his name is pronounced Martin Blochwisch, because he's like a German guy, and he wrote an entire 230-page book <laughs> just on the herbal medicinal uses of all the different parts of the elder. Wow. So o- over winter, I, I did a book all about, you know, the history of the elder, not not like a full history, because that'd be like way too many books. Yeah. Um, but a good, like, introductory history. And then it also goes over growing it and foraging for it. And um, then the other thing that really fascinated me about the elder is, um, you know, like, modern Americans tend to really only think about the berries and maybe also, you know, think about the flowers. Mm-hmm. But there's two sections in the book, one all about preparation, um, which show, you know, different ways you can prepare and use the plant. And then there's a whole section on crafting. Oh, really? Um, because, because the elder, um, you, you know, when you look up the word elder, when you look at its scientific name, it's Sambucus, huh. um, which, which means wind. Because the elder, uh, one of its earliest uses was for making instruments. Um, and making, like, bellows for fire and stuff. Really? Um, that yeah, is so interesting. Wood, you know, so, like, you talk about something you might want to plant on your homestead and why. If you grow elder, you have food, medicine, and craft all in a single plant hmm. that, that, like, is a super, super resilient plant. It grows very, very quickly once established, you know, so... so uh, you know, I, I think that we, we've been growing them, I think, for about six or seven years now. So we had already been growing them long before I had the idea to do the book. Yeah. Um, and, and they really are just such a such a tremendous plant and one everybody should consider adding adding to their homestead. Um, well, we talked a couple only, months you know, ag- yeah, well, we talked a couple months ago. We talked a little bit about that. We were talking about other things, but we talked a little bit about that last time. And I was inspired to go out and add a couple to my homestead. I went and purchased a couple bare root plants uh, from the Stark Brothers yep. and popped them in the ground, and they are doing just fantastic. I can't believe how they've grown already. Yeah, the elders can grow something like um, you know six to eight feet in a single year. Mm. So it's just you know just a fascinating, amazing plant that very vigorous it has so much you know it's kind of like comfrey it's just yeah. one of those plants that you know every homestead should have this plant if you can have this plant what do you mean if you can have it what do you mean by that well there's just um like there you know the interesting thing about the elder is it probably has one of the widest ranges habitats mm-hmm. of any plant you'll find so in, in on the North American continent, you'll find it all the way from northern Mexico all the way up through southern Canada. Mm-hmm. You'll find it from coast to coast, from California to Maine, from Washington all the way down to Texas and Florida. So for the most part, there's very few places you can't grow it. Um, but there are some soil conditions or elevation conditions that can make it oh. trickier to grow. Okay, okay. So... Yeah, so so it's, I, I it's, thought you were going to say it, something like was illegal in some places or something. <laughs> no, thankfully not yet. <laughs> not the, yet, right? The pharmaceutical <laughs> pharmaceutical companies haven't been that successful, but they're trying. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, no doubt about it. But yeah, it's hard to hard to. Uh, well, I was getting ready to say it's hard to make something illegal that grows in the wild, but uh, who knows, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you saw you see what they did to hemp. Yeah, um, exactly. That's what you know, I was they, thinking when I said that. <laughs> yeah, you know, like between the the paper and the, you know the paper and medicinal industry, I shouldn't say medicinal, the paper and pharma, you know, medical mm-hmm. establishment conspired together to get, you know, not just the the CBD side right. of hemp, but even the paper, mm-hmm. you know, fiber side of hemp criminalized. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I put nothing past our are um, now benevolent overlords in terms right. of what they can accomplish in their stupidity. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, sounds like uh, sounds like elderberry is uh, that a really great plant to have on the homestead for sure. And, and I know you've been doing a lot of great things with it. Uh, is the book out already? 
The book comes out. I I should get my early copies um, theoretically at the end of August. Okay, I did see it was for uh, we could pre-order it on Amazon. Even I seen that earlier. Yeah, I'm taking pre-orders if people want signed copies, and if you get a copy straight from me, I'm also doing like some follow-up webinars for mm-hmm. the pre-orders where you can ask questions about the book or just additional questions in general about Elder and Elderberry. So, or you can, or you can pre-order on Amazon. So, yeah. Well, is there anything yeah, so special got, about someone starting an elderberry plant on their property? Is there any like advice as far as getting started with elderberry? I mean, say I'm just new to it. I've never grown it. It's because I am. Uh, I've never grown it before on my property. What advice do you have for somebody just starting out with the plant? Oh, f- uh, five quick tips. Um, one is elder are not drought tolerant. Okay. Now, this has not been a problem the past two years. <laughs> yeah, and this year this should be fine. <laughs> um, so, but they they are um, you know especially their first two years, mm. you know you you have to have a game plan for supplemental irrigation if the plants you know if you get into any kind of even really mild drought conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's kind of you know that that's the first big one. The second big one is you know usually buy an elder and it's very very small. It's like you know, a little six inch, eight inch mm-hmm. plant, um, or my favorite way to propagate them is hardwood or softwood cuttings. Yeah. Um, cause hardwood and softwood cuttings are really, really inexpensive. So you can get a whole bunch of them and then you, you know, you can just go to town. Um, you can usually get like half a dozen hardwood or softwood cuttings, um, for the same price as, you know, one plant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so I really like going with the hardwood or softwood cuttings. I usually recommend to people get like two or three different varieties mm-hmm. um, because there, there's some debate over if elder are self-fertile and how self-fertile they are as a plant. Yeah, um, I, did so read, I, like was, I was reading some controversy on them. Like I was trying to decide if I should get a couple varieties and, and, uh, you know, I would read one thing and say, you know, it'd say something different here and there. And I was like, well, I'm just going to get two varieties anyway. So I got a, a Johns and an Adams is the two I've got on my property. Yeah. And, you know, and e- even, even if, you know, beyond the self fertile issue, you know, we planted four varieties on our farm mm-hmm. and those four varieties have all performed incredibly differently from one another really like so so i have yeah it's, it's just like in the book i have some pictures and then in some talks i'm giving this coming year to go along with the book i have some photos just showing me like i'm you know this is the outdoor outdoor edition of you interviewing me because i'm getting ready for the storms as we talk so i'm looking <laughs> at one of our elder so like we have this one elder bush and it is a solid 14 15 feet tall um, it yields probably 50 to 60 percent of all the berries we get this one bush. And then we have these we have these other ones and they are like, you know, seven feet tall. We might get like a dozen clusters of berries off those ones. It, it, you know, it's just like each of the each of the cultivars has performed incredibly differently for us. How old is um, that? Is that 14 foot tall plant? Um, at this point, I think it's in its sixth or seventh year, really? but I, I'm really okay. bad with time and dates. Um, so, so you need to have my wife on if you want that kind of information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of the same way. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, I know I've planted them at some point cause I brought them home after speaking at a mother's news fair many years ago. And I'm just like, I, I know I've planted them sometime and I know, I know what time of year I planted them, but the exact year. Uh, now, I struggle you, to keep all you, the kids' birthdays straight. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Now, do you know what variety that one is, or do we need to talk to your wife for that too? <laughs> well, well, nobody knows. Oh, um, I just popped them around here and there, huh? Well, because like you know, they um, they were giving away some hardwood cuttings oh, at the okay. fair, and over the course of two years, I think we got like six or seven total hardwood cuttings. Mm. And, you know, they might have told us when they handed us the hardwood cuttings what varieties they were, but it's not like it's, you know, it's not like you can look at a piece of wood and be like, you're a this. <laughs> right, right. Um, 
so, and then, you know, then we just, you know, so even if they had told us what it was by the time we got home from the fair, we no longer had any idea. And then, you know, we just propped, plopped them down in the ground, hither and thither around the farm. And, and so that, that information is long forgotten and lost in terms of what exact cultivar they are. But we, but we know which one has done the best on our farm. Yeah, so that's we all know really matter, we're, right? <laughs> yeah. So interestingly, I need to check the rest of our bushes, but the one that has grown the best is the only one that so far I've seen I'm a fungal disease on. Mm. So, um, so that, that's going to be an interesting trade-off if it's slightly more susceptible to fungal diseases, especially in really wet years, yeah, um, hmm. such, such as growing things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, this year we're just going to have all kinds of challenges. Yes, last year I thought it was more the uh, the insect issue, and I just have a feeling it's definitely going to be the, <laughs> the, the rain issue this year. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the thing is I thought with the mild winter we were going to have much, much worse mm-hmm. pest pressure this spring. And we've actually had um, really just not significant pest pressure. Yeah, I'm so experiencing far. the same thing. Yeah, you know, other other than the normal squash vine borer squash bug, mm-hmm. which is like about the only thing that gets me almost willing to use non-organic controls. <laughs> Is is those, those guys? It's yes, like, they will push your buttons. That's for sure. I know. Last year, I had a really bad year with with the. Uh, well, it wasn't even the boars. It was just the squash bugs that I was really having. Yeah. just a time with. They were just crazy last year. Yeah. Well, and it's almost you know like with with growing squash at this point because we have a high tunnel. I basically grow them until just like we hit peak squash bug season, and then I just like. I'm going to let somebody else deal with this. So, yeah. so I, I guess like, is there, th- there might be like an organic approved control. It might be called like in trust or it might be Pyganic. I can't remember which one. And I thought about getting it, but it is in, it's it, a little goes a long way. I guess like a bottle, mm-hmm. a bottle covers like four acres of treatment. Oh, wow. Um, but a bottle's like $400. Whoa. <laughs> So, you know, so like it works really well for for commercial mm-hmm. elderberry people, not elderberry commercial growers of anything. Um, but like I'm, you know, I'm not at a commercial scale quite. We grow a good bit for sale, but I'm I'm managing thirty thousand square feet, not three hundred thousand. Right, right, right. Now, do so, you notice any kind of pest pressure on elderberry in particular, or is it pretty much? Uh... Oh. Uh, it, it depends on where you are. Um, yeah. Elder has, you know, since it's such a vigorous plant, it's one of those plants kind of like sweet potatoes mm-hmm. where a little bit of pest pressure really isn't going to bother it. But, like, um, you have to be careful with Japanese, um, you know, the Japanese beetles. Mm-hmm. They, like, you know, they'll just decimate pole beans, Raspberry yeah. stuff like that in our area. That was my thing last year. They got uh, yeah, it was raspberries. We got it real hard. We have some rose bushes. They demolished those. My grapevines. They took my. They about took the grapevines out and and the pole beans as well. Yeah, they were just there was just certain things, but there was four or five things they hit and they just demolished them. Yeah, and what happens with elder is they don't prefer elder, but as they like as they multiply a number and begin to just like crush their main crops, mm-hmm. they'll spread over to the elder. You, you, you know, so, so you, you can, can, you know, it's like... It's second choice um, meal. <laughs> yeah, a second, really like a second or third choice to them. And so, you know, the, the best things you can do with the Japanese beetles, is obviously, you can do pheromone traps and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, but you really want to look into long-term applying beneficial nematodes. Nematodes, yep, I've heard that. And I used some traps last year. Big mistake. When you have a small property like I do, it just attracts them Uh onto your property because you can't get them far enough away from your vegetable garden. It just brings them in, you know. You really need some acreage to and put them in a, you know, back 40 somewhere, those traps to draw them away from your garden. Yeah, it's definitely, I've heard that it's it's tricky with the trap depending on your layout and setup and other Mm -hmm. factors that it, sometimes makes things better but sometimes makes things a whole lot worse yeah 
So, so that's just something yeah. I have to keep an eye on then for the elderberry because being you know, first year they're planted, I'm sure they'll, you know, you, I'm definitely gonna have to watch them and, and just kind of, you know, the first couple of years it's they're they're gonna be more delicate and you're gonna have to they're not gonna be able to kind of overtake the bug pressure maybe this first year or two maybe. Oh yeah, so you know, let's finish the tips. Um, elder, so elder aren't drought tolerant. Best to plant a few different varieties. Um, they the the first year or so they don't do well with weed pressure. Hmm. Um, so it's really good to mulch them, you know, so like a, a good rotted wood chip mulch, mm-hmm. a good shredded leaf mulch, um, you know, f- find, find a good appropriate mulch for them and keep them mulched. Um, because you know, that, then they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not losing out resources to try and competing with weeds. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, the, and, you know, mulch is beneficial as well because it keeps um, moisture in the ground. Right. So, it, you know, because they like, a wet, you know, like think about where you find elder in the wild. You find them in ditches, drainage areas, um, you know, along the sides of roadsides where it slopes down and water collects, you, you know, so, so they like moist areas. So by mulching, you kind of mimic um, what the plant wants. And the other reason you really want to mulch is you can't cultivate around elder. Um, so if you're used to like, you know, cultivating around plants to keep weed pressure at bay, the way the elder's root system forms is very, very shallow. Oh. Um, it spreads and, out. And so it, yeah, if you cultivate, you will do significant damage to the plant. Oh, okay. Um, so, so you can't rely on cultivation to care for the elder. So, you know, mulching is to be preferred. I've been, um, or you're I, just gonna, I have some wood mulch yeah. around mine, but something else I've been doing is just, you know, I have so much comfrey around here. I've been doing a lot of chop and drop comfrey. I mean, would you think that there's any benefit to that? Or, I mean, other than just being mulch, or will it benefit from the, uh, the nutrients of comfrey? Yeah, well, it depends on your soil. Mm-hmm. You, you know, so like, you know, if this coming winter goes well, I think I might finally finish my soil book but you know like the the first thing i always tell people when they say should i do something to (laughs) should i do x to my soil the first thing i always ask is have you done a soil test Mm -hmm. because until you've done a soil test you don't know what you should do to your soil yeah and as long you know and and, you know the, the way i always put it is until you test it's just a guess yeah that's what i kind of like about comfrey because it really isn't it's not that you're bringing in anything new it's just the kind of this accumulation of the nutrients that are already there and you're just kind of yeah. magnifying them on top of the on top of the ground rather than down deep you know it's kind of my thinking on on comfrey anyway yeah well yeah it's a dynamic accumulator mm, right. it recycles nutrients from deep in the ground my only concern is i in doing consulting for a few different farmers and homesteaders they have oversaturated. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that. Wow. Did the wind carry you away? Or? <laughs> no, my um, my earbuds got caught on my knee as I was washing my hands off of some dirt. <laughs> um, so, but um, I I've had a number of people send me soil test results. You know, mm-hmm. like one lady, um, she had some raised beds, and this is really really common. Um, like this is very common, so hopefully it'll help a lot of readers, especially ones who are kind of in their first few years of, you know, homesteading and growing food. But usually, you know, like you put a garden in your first year and you're going to, you know, you put down animal manure, um, or you put down compost and you grow some things and you have a pretty good first year. You have a really, really good second year and you might have a really, really good third year. Um, or in the third year, you might have another okay year. And then you hit year four, and your plants often will still grow fairly good, but you begin to see declining yields. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you double down on applying compost Mm -hmm. and other amendments. Yeah. And then in year five, you send me an email going like, why is my garden not working anymore? And oh, I usually, yeah, and I usually ask you, and I, you know, it's funny because, like, you know, generally I already know exactly what they're going to say. Um, but I ask, you know, well, how have you been managing, how have you been managing this growing space? And they're like, well, you know, like, 
I put down manure every single year because, you know, a lot of people rely on animal manures or compost to provide nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this is, is animal manures contain far too much potassium and phosphorus Mm. for far too little nitrogen. And so you can get away with that for a number of years, depending on how you grow. But unless you grow, you know, unless you grow a lot of beans, a lot of peas, unless you intercrop and cover crop with, you know, legumes and nitrogen fixers, basically what you start doing is you start running, you know, elevated phosphorus and potassium levels and you're, you're having, you know, nitrogen deficiencies at the same time. And, yeah. and it, it yeah. just becomes a compounding problem. And it, and it matters what you plant, too, because, I mean, certain plants are going to take up more of some than others. I mean, some plants will, that are, you know, really heavy, uh, have really heavy nutrient requirements, they're going to pull up certain things more so than another plant. I mean, like lettuce isn't going to uh, take too much from the soil at all. But, you know, like tomatoes and peppers very well may. So, I mean, that yeah. right there can well, probably out of balance as well. Well, and that's why, like, I really, really like um, growing both, like, grain crops Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a lot of legumes like peas and green beans and and other varieties of beans. They they leave nitrogen, but they take a tremendous amount of phosphorus and potassium. Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, if if you're going to be somebody who who wants to use a lot of manure, a lot of compost to build soil, especially build the soil's organic matter levels, um, then you have to be committed to growing a lot of legumes yeah. um, because, you, you know, you need a way to, um, you need a way to cycle out some of that, some of the P and K and provide supplemental nitrogen. But as you pointed out, like you really can't, you don't want to really do that around something like elderberry because of the root system. So you're going to have to just feed that those nutrients to the top of the soil around that plant then pretty much. Yeah. Well, you can, you know, like um, especially after the first year, mm-hmm. you know, what I would do is I would under sow something like a Dutch white clover mm. um, or a red clover underneath my elder Um to, to basically establish, like, a clover base. Okay. Um, to really, like, you know, re- really make them happy. Because, um, you know, clovers are fairly good at crowding out competing plants. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, so, and the nice thing is you can sow clovers right into a mulch. Yeah. And, and they'll kind of grow up and through the mulch. So I also like clovers for that reason. So they're probably going to really compete with the root. The, the root area because they're shallow rooted too and thin roots and not really going to hurt do any harm to the roots of the elderberry then yeah, well I, well the thing and you know, the thing that i seen with root systems is some are competitive and some are synergistic mm-hmm. yeah and and like clover roots uh, you know because like you know the average person thinks of the ideal garden as isolated rows of tomatoes <laughs> um and isolated rows of potatoes and that person would hate my garden (laughs) yeah and and like in in my garden um my goal by like you know basically july is if you can see the ground i've done something wrong (laughs) yeah um like i i I don't want a square inch of soil available for the sun to see so it's you know so so like I, you know, I want as much clover and other stuff taking up space mm-hmm. or plants that we're growing or whatever. Um, and that's another way you can handle elevated nutrient levels in your growing spaces. But the other really big benefit of having a lot of crops going at once is because every plant represents stored nutrients. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, it's basically a way you keep fertilizer in your garden constantly cycling instead of getting washed down and out yeah 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 we try to use up all that extra space like you said with clover also i grow a lot of purslane um 
Yeah, and uh-huh. that, that is an excellent uh, crop to grow around things. Like I'll grow it around tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of stuff, and it stays low. And I'll keep it cut low, even if it starts to get too high, and it just covers up the soil. Plus, we eat a ton of it in salads and stuff, you know, and soups yeah. and everything else. So, I mean, crops like that do a, do a great job of covering up that soil and benefiting uh, the soil a little bit, and uh, and uh, even providing you food in, in a lot of cases. Oh yeah, there's so many, you know, so many things people consider weeds. Mm-hmm. Um, or, 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 you know, like, you know, homesteaders are looking for ways to, you know, make money. Um, so we have a lot of red clover. And red clover blossoms sell for, like, $20 a pound. No kidding. <laughs> um, you know, like, organic red clover blossoms? Yeah. Crazy expensive. Wow. Um, so one thing we're going to do along with our elderberry syrup business is we're going to start offering some teas. Mm. And, it, and it's going to be basically a mixture of, like, dried elderberries, um, dried raspberry leaf. Um, we have tons of lemon. And it's all going to be, like, herbs and stuff that we grow on the farm mm-hmm. that grow in abundance. And, you, you know, like, tea blends, um, you know, it's something like, you know, 20 little bags of tea. Each bag, I think, is, like, 23 ounces or something ridiculous. They sell for, like, $8. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, so some of this stuff too, when you don't have all this bare space, it's not only going to benefit your other plants, it's going to benefit your soil, it's going to reduce your weeding pressure and other things. But if you're smart about them, they either become food or they become a, an opportunity for, you know, financial gain from your homestead. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's so many things we could do that, uh, do with like that. Uh, I mean, I think about comfrey, you know, that's something we, I just grow a ton of around here. I first brought it on the property and it has so many benefits right here. But then I get hit up like every week someone wanting to buy some comfrey from me, you know, some, some crowns or some, some uh, root cuttings or something. And it's like, wow, there's a real opportunity there for anyone who would want to grow a lot of that on our property. Oh, yeah. So yeah, the, you know, it's, yeah, cause like, uh, you know, I'm sure as you see from your listenership, just, you know, every year there's more people trying homesteading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's more and more people who are like, where can I get these plants? And what can I do with these plants? And um, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah. So it's And that's something so, so that think, really kind of fascinated me about elderberry, too, when I, especially when I hear how easy it is to propagate and, you know, from the cuttings and, and things like that. I'm thinking it would be a really easy plant to probably expand and grow. And maybe even, I mean, if you had a bunch of it, perhaps even sell uh, cuttings at some point. Yeah, it, well, and especially with the, like, uh, you know, I hope elderberry doesn't go the way of CBD, <laughs> where, where, where you know, because CBD is in the midst of what's probably going to be a really big boom and bust cycle, yeah. is my guess. Um, so I'm hoping elderberry doesn't go quite that hard, um, but but there definitely is right now so much interest in the plant, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of opportunity um, and, and yeah, I mean, once you have established plants, um, cause you know, they need pruned, they need some, you know, other, so you're going to have this pruned wood from the plant. Mm-hmm. And if you're pruning back, you know, healthy wood, um, you can either propagate more, more elder for yourself, or you can sell, you know, the pruned wood as hardwood cuttings and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's just no reason not to do that. Yeah, I'm sure there. I mean, I, I actually I haven't even seen the cuttings really for sale too many places. I I bought the bare root plants uh, from a nursery, and uh, and those were nice. They were about eight or ten inches long, and uh, maybe a little bit taller than that. They did really really well. Like I said, they just took right off. I mean, they started leafing when within a week after I put them in the ground, and they did really well, uh, really well. But I don't know how cuttings. I never took cuttings from one. Obviously, I don't know how fast they they grow, or if there's just a a, a lot longer of a delay in that. But I'm sure it's a little slower getting started with them. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the thing is, I'd have to see what kind of bare root plants, but, you know, generally from my understanding is like a really, if you buy like a really healthy plant, Mm -hmm. it's about six months ahead of if you were to start from, you know, hardwood cuttings. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Um, How does the elderberry do through the winter? I mean, they're really hardy uh, for for winter survival. Do you have to do anything to kind of prep them for, for a cold winter? Well, if you're, you know, you just need to choose varieties mm-hmm. that are, you know, hardy for your zones. Yeah. Um, you know, because, again, it grows all the way up into Canada. 
and you know all throughout the northern part of you know the U.S. Um, so you just want to look for varieties um, that do better in you know colder weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, interestingly, what the the big risk not just to elder but really other plants because farther north you have snow generally yeah. for most of the winter. And Rutgers did a really interesting study where they showed that um, snow, like a six to nine inch layer of snow on the ground, raised the temperature under the snow by like 40 degrees mm. <laughs> over the ambient air temperature. Um, so, so farther south, you can like, you know, mulch over the elders some in the fall after pruning and stuff to protect them, you, you know, special, you know, to kind of give some protection to the crown. But but generally, they're a very hardy plant. They've been around a long time. So as long as nothing super extreme happens, they should they should do just fine without too much intervention. As long as you've chosen a good variety. Yeah, and you find that full sun is the place to be for them. They really enjoy that the best. Yeah, you, you really want them full. You know, full sun to mostly sun. Yeah, that's what I did with mine. Um, that was a suggestion when I bought them, so I just popped them in the full sun. And, you know, but I've had them, like, they'll tell me that. I, You know, you read the package on, like, rhubarb or something, they'll tell you that too. But that's not my experience with rhubarb. It doesn't like that, but it'll tell you that. So I was <laughs> kind of curious if that was true or not. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, with, with the elder, again, it goes back to moisture. Um, like, and it also depends just on your goals and yields and stuff mm-hmm. because, you know, the elder grow primarily along, like, you know, where pasture meets forest line. So so they tend to grow in mostly sunny to partial shade. Mm-hmm. But, the, the you know, those wild varieties, they don't have uniform ripening. Yeah. But, like, they have a number of characteristics that make it work that they don't grow, you know, that they can grow in those conditions. Whereas if you're buying a production variety of elder, where it has, you know, more uniform fruiting, more uniform ripening, and more berries per, you know, b- you know basically, um, you know, fruiting cane, um, then, you know, you're going to want that to have more sun if mm-hmm. you want to get the most yields possible out of the plant. You'll still get decent yield in, you know, partially shady to mostly sunny um, but the plant won't reach its full potential in terms of, you know, how much fruit fruit it can give you. Right, right. Uh, you know, but but if all you have is like, you know, uh, a partially shady place to put them, I would not hesitate to put them in there. I guess I have to ask you this because I, I hear debate about this all the time, and 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 I know I kind of know which side you're going to fall on, but I hear people say, you know, you cannot eat uncooked berries you cannot pop those in your mouth they're, they're really toxic they can do you a lot of harm don't do it and then you hear other people say no they're fine <laughs> where do you fall on that exactly <laughs> so the university of missouri is sitting on um some research they just completed on this very topic and so basically you know the the back story for listeners is um the elder plant contains a number of really toxic compounds, which is one reason it was used medicinally, because Mm -hmm. these toxic compounds also, you know, serve as very potent medicine when prepared right and taken in the right way and stuff. So everybody from, you know, Hippocrates to Galen to Pliny to Culpepper, you know, all talk about the various medicinal uses of the different parts of the elder plant. Um, One of the compounds is a cyanide-forming glucosid. I think I'm pronouncing that right. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, cyanide, cyanide is no bueno. (laughs) You know, unless, like, you're, you know, unless you're, unless you're Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible and you're captured by the enemy and you have to end your life post-haste before they extract secrets from you. Um, But, but, uh, you know, for those of us who are not super spies, we tend to try and avoid cyanide whenever possible. Yeah. Apple seeds also can eat that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's such a small amount in apple seeds. Yeah. You know, you, where, whereas um, elder contains, you know, these cyanide-forming glucosids in the entire plant, mm. except for, I believe, the flowers don't contain them. Um, the flowers might be the only part of the plant that's free 
uh, of this particular chemical. So, uh, so, so one thing we run into with it with elder is there's actually three, I should say, sorry, four, um, four, dis- four semi-distinct um, elders running around. Three in America, one in Europe. So the, the European one's technical name is Sambucus nigra. The the American has three varieties. We have a red, we have a blue, and then we have um, one, you know Sambucus canadensis, which is our dark you know ours that is most similar to the European elder. Um, and and one thing to realize is when you buy probably 95% or more of elderberry products on the market are made from your European elderberries, mm. not American. Um, so, so there is a rapidly growing domestic um, American elderberry, you know, elderberry crop. It just t- it, Again, it's, it's similar to like hemp and CBD, where um, right now as we're talking, over in Missouri – is the annual elderberry growers conference. Mm. Um, and I saw pictures from it and there's a buttload of people there. So, so domestic production is increasing rapidly, but you know, I, I would even wager to say that even still at this point, probably 99% of elderberry products on Amazon or at your local health food store are made with European elderberries. So, so, you know, we have American, you know, we, we have the Negro, the European, we have the American Canadensis, and University of Missouri b- basically did a whole bunch of tests on, like, both plants and their berries and stuff. And what they found was that the American, you know, the, the American variety of elderberry, when the berries are fully ripe, did not contain any detectable cyanide forming glucosides oh. at all. Absolutely zero. But they also found that even even with that, there are still some people who are sensitive to raw American elderberries and they don't know why. Um, so it, it is so um, generally speaking, you know, what I tell people is if you want to try elderberries raw um, it, it, and, and so there's a couple of problems. One is some European cultivars are now grown in America. Mm. And it's not like when you come across an elderberry bush that you are going to easily be able to tell, is this an American or a European cultivar? Right. You know, it's not like you can lift up, you know, it's not like you can like, you know, check it somehow. <laughs> um <laughs> So, you know, it's not it's not like when you're checking pigs, whatever, when they come out of the litter, and you're like, oh, boy, oh, girl, you know, like, like you, you would have to have some very special skills to be able to differentiate elder varieties, um, you know, that you just come across. Um, so there, there's that issue in play as well. So I just tell people, you know, if you want to try raw elder elderberries, just, you know, do it in moderation and see mm-hmm. how you respond. Yeah. Because... You know, if you eat a very small handful of berries, like 20 or 30 berries, at the worst, you might feel a little crampy or something if, if mm-hmm. they, you know, whereas if you, if you eat a whole bunch of raw elderberries and you are sensitive or it is a European variety, um, you're going to be, you're going to be very unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like when I used to so. go into a mulberry uh, tree and eat about, you know, I don't know, a grocery bag full of them and I come out not feeling too good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so you know, so, so but theoretically, um, you should be able to eat raw American elderberries for okay. the vast majority of people. You know, their taste for the most part isn't super. You know, like you come across a ripe wild black raspberry, yeah. and and you're just like, I never want to eat any other berry ever again. Like this is amazing. Um, and you eat like fully ripe raw elderberries. And you're probably going to be like, this is okay. Yeah. Y- you know, it's, um, the, you know, they, I, I think elderberries really shine in like the wide variety of traditional ways that they, you know, have been prepared and used historically. Like syrups and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, because basically for all of human history, they are either cooked or they were fermented. Yeah, I have um, some goji berry on, on my place, and I'm like that with goji berry. Like, if just to pick them off of the off of the bush and eat them, not really good. I mean, you just have a weird taste to them. But you can cook <laughs> them in something, or you can uh, dehydrate them. Now, if you dehydrate them, they get like a raisin quality, and they're really, really yep. good like that. Just simply dehydrating them changes the entire flavor uh, uh, profile of them. It's amazing. But, yeah, right off the bush, yep. not, not a good berry. Really not good at all. Yeah. So that, that's my thoughts on, and that's what the research currently says about. Okay, I almost didn't expect you to say that. I thought you'd just say, "I probably shouldn't eat them." You know, period. I didn't know that that the two, uh, the European and the American, that there was such a difference in them. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've always heard you shouldn't eat them. You know, and then here recently, I've seen a lot of people debating that. So I've eaten them all my life, and you know, talking about eating them and stuff. And then it's like, wow, which is it? You know, and then you know, even when I bought the ones that I that I purchased. You know, right on that website, there's all these are great just eating berries right off of the bush, you know. And I'm like, oh, bro, are you really going to put that on your uh, website? I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it, well, and, you know, one of the sellers of plants I actually sent a message to about that very thing. Mm-hmm. You may want to, like, amend, <laughs> yeah, not amend, for everybody, amend what you're huh? saying here because, as you know, if somebody gets sick eating berries off a plant, you told them, like, in our lawsuit, happy day and age. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, like, I'm sure selling both American and European cultivars on the site. Yeah, maybe. But they might be saying all of, you know, I'd have to go back and look unless they pay me. I just ain't going to do this. Because, <laughs> um, they, you know, if you're selling plants, you need to have a specialist who can fact check everything you say about them for you. Yeah. Um but, like, you know, if they're selling European ones, you definitely can't eat the European ones straight off yeah. the plant. Um, an organization called the Nordic Food Lab actually did human trials on their own staff. Oh, wow. Um, with, raw el- with raw elderberries, just That's to confirm. You don't, want to work that- you don't want to work for that company. <laughs> no, no, I mean, they, they all willingly did it together. It's like the whole office team together was like, let's do this. So... That's dedication. Um, That's a dedicated employer yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. or, you know, think of it's just like we all need a sick day. Yeah, it's the king's cup bearer there. If you, if you guys die, you get a day off. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, so you know they they all ended up having, you know, anywhere from very mild to I wouldn't say like super severe, but somewhat moderately unhappy reaction to raw European elderberries. Yeah. So you go well, it sounds, like it's a, sounds like a good plan. It sounds like you probably want to lean towards the, the American probably. I don't know. I mean, there might be a medicinal uh, value in the European uh, varieties that, that uh, the American variety doesn't have. I don't know. I mean, it just depends on your purposes well, and what you were really looking for, I guess. Well, well, well that's going to be the next big debate mm-hmm. um, because, the, the American varieties, you'll notice if you, you'll, you'll notice immediately the first year you grow them and you make something out of your American berries, mm-hmm. that they produce a very different colored juice oh. than the European. And that is because the American berries have a very different um, phytochemical composition. So their their polyphenols and other chemicals of the American elder differ in in a number of ways from their European cousin. Yeah. And so so I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a bit of a tussle over if that matters and if so, in what ways. I could I could see I could see that. I mean, I could see that it would have. You know, it would have, obviously have differences. It's just made up different, so it's going to have some differences. So it may work better in one way and not as good in another way. And you know, it, everything's got its own purposes, and it's you know, it's the way it's just it's put together. And I could see that being true. You know, if that would find out that's the case. Yeah. Well, and I think the big thing is, you know, like as far back as um, the 1200s or so is when people noticed that the elder berries were good for the immune system. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, the real question is going to be, what, if any, differences between the American and European, especially in that area? Yeah. The big reason a lot of people buy elderberry supplements and take elderberry 
is during cold and flu season. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, so that's really like the, you know, the main draw to the plant. And so figuring out if the European and American are equal in that area is just going to be very, you know, very useful information for everyone to have. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there'll be, a, yeah, there'll be definitely be some ongoing research in that. I'm sure they'll come to a conclusion in another yeah, decade or so. <laughs> yeah, I, it, you know, like I, I think so because research is so clouded by um, bias. Yeah. I, I think you're going to see like the, the growing American elderberry industry, um, <laughs> you know, basically, basically have some repeated back and forth. Elderberry um, mafia. We're going to keep the, keep the yeah. man down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With, with the European and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause you know, studies, it, like people, you know, it's very hard to prove certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, pe- people always want like a high degree of certainty, which is why it's really hard when, you know, I'm always telling people, well, it depends, <laughs> you know, yeah, should yeah. I do this to my plants? Well, it depends. It's it's safest it's phrase just, in the world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, but just also one of the truest because yeah, it does. You, Everything you know, depends. Yeah. <laughs> one of my sons has been, Slacking in his potato bug smashing, uh, <laughs> smashing duties. Thank, thankfully, the potatoes are all coming out over the next two weeks. So, just as the potato bugs really get going, they're not going to have anything to eat. Yeah. Well, hopefully, your potatoes aren't waterlogged. <laughs> well, you know, years ago when I designed our main growing space, I, I made some decisions to um. You know, basically make it so that I'm never waterlogged, mm-hmm. but that I have really good water infiltration and retention. Um, so I basically designed our growing space as a series of like lightly terraced, you know, little swales. Yeah, it's like growing on a swale hill. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like little swales and lightly terraced bed, then, you know, then a small path, then another little swale lightly terraced bed, then a small path. Um, and so when we do get heavy rain, the rain gets slowed down too, because we just have mm. so much root matter. And then we also have mulch. Yeah. So all, all that kinetic energy, the rain brings gets broken up so that it's not moving soil. Um, right. and, and instead it's, you know, as much of the rain as possible is infiltrating and then once, you know, once the soil reaches capacity, it helps that we're on um, sinkhole country. And so there's always somewhere where we live for excess water to go. Yeah. yeah. And worst so, case scenario it, with the setup you have, you might have stem standing in the paths, but that'd be about it. And then, yeah. yeah. See, I've never even had water standing in our no. paths. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, like the, the, the uh, did you hear about the Corvette Museum down in Bowling Green, Kentucky? That, I like, know of it, but ago, I didn't hear any new news about it. Yeah, yeah. A number of years ago, a sinkhole swallowed like one whole section of the museum with I, with a bunch of cars. I do remember that. That has been a while back. Yeah, but now that you're saying, yeah. it, I recall. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's the southern end of a geological formation, and we live on the northern end of that same geology. Mm. Um, so they lose Corvettes. To sinkholes, we lose cows. <laughs> yeah, neither one's good. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I'd much rather lose a Corvette than a cow. For <laughs> yeah, me <but>. too. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. I wouldn't want to pay the the property taxes on a Corvette anyway, or the insurance. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So well, hopefully, I don't swallow your elderberry. <laughs> <laughs> no, ho- hopefully. Well, you know, elder in this area, they often grow around the sinkholes. So really? you know, if you're looking. Well, so like if you're foraging for yeah. elder, you, you know, they, they, u- they usually grow in places that people don't use machinery. Um, mm. So, al- you know, along roadside ditches, along sinkholes, along fence line, um, where pasture meets wood line, along certain types of hillsides, th- that's where you're going to generally find them in the wild. So b- because, you know, they, since they are shallow rooted, cultivation, repeated mowings and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, really do a number. The only other thing I'll add if somebody decides to grow elder is they get really, really big. 
Yeah, I'm kind of yeah, I'm kind of going by the recommendations. I got one of the plant size on my bottom. I spaced them out a little bit, but I'm thinking they're going to be still by the time they you know a few years, they're probably going to be right up into each other, real close to each other. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and traditionally, um, one of the most traditional uses of elderberry is um, making screens and hedges. Mm, yeah. So. Yeah, that yeah, might I'm be see it would do well for that with the height and the. It said the varieties that I got, I think, were like eight to ten feet is what they said they would grow to. I think I, I can't really remember, but yeah, and that, that seemed like it'd be a good height for where I've got them at. Yeah, and so you know, if you're somebody who's into like, oh, I want to try a living fence, mm-hmm. um, or like a you know, a, a elder would be a plant I would definitely consider. Yeah. If I was trying to make like a living fence or like a privacy, you know, say you live. So you live in like a, a suburban area, um, so you have neighbors close by. And the and the wonderful thing about elder is they're a really beautiful plant. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you prune them right, you can be in the most draconian homeowners association, <laughs> and you should still be able to get away with, you know, having a lot of elders growing yeah. on your property um, be, because they're you know they're kind of like service berry. Yeah. So you you can get away with growing these. Yeah, they got, I think they have a nice looking foilage to them. I, I, they're looking at some full grown plants here and there. In the wild, they get kind of. I think they get a little spindly and sticking out. But I think if you if you pruned them right and had them tight together, yeah, I think they really thicken up and look really nice. Yeah, it, it's um, interesting. The elderberry's kind of tangled growth habit mm-hmm. is one reason. One of its names is the Judas tree, <laughs> um, with the idea that. Judas hung himself on an elder, and the elder was cursed, um, you know, by <laughs> being a part of Judas. So, so I go, you know, th- there is a lot of fascinating lore and, and stories that are tied into the plant. But, you know, one thing I go over in the book is um, I talk about, um, you know, different varieties of elder, but there's a bunch of ornamental elderberries now Mm. so like there's one called black beauty um and another one called black lace yeah that have purple um leaves oh um and then there's another one called like lemony lace and it's leaf tips it'll like at the base of the leaves it'll be green but as you move to the leaf tips the leaf tips become like a a lemon yellow type color Mm. Um, so are these just like a hybrid varieties that they've come up with or yeah well you know like um, I, I, I it's one thing I haven't got to look into yet is how how they developed these varieties mm-hmm. um, so I'd probably need you know I'd probably just need to ask somebody at the Midwest Elderberry Cooperative because my guess is one of those people know or at the University of Missouri yeah um, but the, like the interesting thing with the elderberry is it produces a really large number of really small berries. And then each berry, I believe, contains around five to eight seeds, if my memory is correct. So that's a, you know, so a single elderberry bush, theoretically, when it's mature, probably produces like 10,000 seeds. Do they grow well from seed? Um, it's a bit of a pain to grow them from seed. So you can do it, but the other issue with growing from seed is, is, you know, like, how many people grow potatoes from seed? Right, yeah. Well, one of the reasons you don't grow potatoes from seed is because you introduce genetic variability, which can be good or bad. Um, And so um, there's a really neat Facebook group called, I think, like, TSP, True or TPS, true potato seed growers. Um, And I've seen some new varieties of potatoes that people have basically uncovered Mm. by growing from, um, you you know, growing from seed instead of just, you know, because when you grow from seed potatoes, um, seed potatoes are an, an exact genetic clone of the parent. Right. Um, whereas when you grow from seed, you have now introduced natural genetic variation back into the equation. Um, and so 
it's your Forrest Gump moment. You know, plants are like a box of chocolates. You have no idea what you're going to get inside, <laughs> um, which can be really good or really bad. Um, kind of like see, saving the seeds from a hybrid tomato. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, you know, planting different species really close to one another. Mm-hmm, yeah, um, cross-pollination, and, yeah. and then, yeah, they cross-pollinate, and then you could end up with a really amazing something next year, um, or you could end up with Lord knows what. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Frank, Franken plants. So you don't see, I mean, you probably don't let too many berries hit the ground, but you don't see them popping up from seed uh, from around oh, the no, bushes? Oh, no, we, we, well, now generally speaking, you won't get too many that pop up from seed right around the bushes. Okay, birds, yeah, take them away, don't they? Yeah. Um, partly, too, though, it's because the plant itself reproduces by runners. Oh, okay. So, so this is one reason the elderberry needs so much space is um, it, it's it's going to send out runners once the main plant is established mm-hmm. and, and basically radiate out in a circle, putting out more and more plants f- from the base of the plant. Okay. Um, so it, it's going to, you know, it, it's going to be jamming and really kind of expand its space. And, and you know, like the new growth from runners, because it has the full support of the existing plant, is going to be very, very vigorous. It's not like a, it's not, it, it doesn't quite spread like I would say raspberry or something like that, does it? Oh, no, it's very similar. It, it, oh, it, really? It, It'll send out runners that far and pop up everywhere, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, like generally speaking, um, unless you're going to prune it heavily, you should allot like uh, eight by eight area for each Uh-oh. elder plant. <laughs> uh oh. Um, so, and, and again, you, you know, like, Commercial growers, I think, are planting them on like two to four foot spacing. Yeah. Um, partly because they prune, you know, partly they do it because, you know, say you're planting a half acre or an acre of elderberries. Mm-hmm. That's a whole lot of hardwood cuttings to purchase. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think, you know, for a elderberry farm to be viable in terms of equipment and, you know, economies of scale, um, you, you want to get probably up into the, like the five ten acre range. So um, we were talking a little bit ago about building like a, a living wall with them. What would be the closest you would plant them if you were going to prune them into like a wall for for privacy? Uh, I think about six feet. Okay, is is a really good, is, really good spacing depending on the variety. Um, so I allow you know, they're going to spread about three feet, you know, touching each other each, each way and yeah, and um, pruning like and, that. And, okay. Yeah, and then you you know you're just going to need to prune you know take care to prune them and train them to create the kind of wall or hedge that you're mm. really looking for. Okay. So yeah, I, I planted the ones I planted. I actually probably planted them about five feet. Now I, I intended them for it to be pretty tight, and I was going to prune them right, but I well, probably went about five feet with mine. So I'm, I'm wondering I'm, that's probably pretty close. I'm probably going to be pretty aggressive on the pruning in the middle of them there. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, the nice thing is, like, if you feel they're a little too close, in, in just a few years, you're going to be able to take your own cuttings. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be able to manage and expand and easily redo kind of the shape of your elderberry patch. Now, could you dig up the runners, too, and plant those other places? I mean, do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can propagate the plant. It, it's one of the amazing things about the elder is you can propagate it from seed. You can do softwood cuttings. Um, mm-hmm. I did my first soft softwood cuttings this year um, just to check the information in my book and to make sure what I put in the book kind of was accurate. But it, it like um, it, it propagates fairly easy from softwood cuttings. It propagates easily from hardwood cuttings, and you can even dig up runners and stuff of the plants to propagate it as well. Wow. So it wants to live and and, and, and uh, spread itself around, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's one reason I like it is um, Joel Salatin had a quote recently he posted that I think was a quote from a guy by the name of Darren Doherty, who is a regenerative farmer mm-hmm. in Australia, um, if I'm remembering correctly. But Darren travels all over the world speaking about regenerative farming practices and stuff. 
And the quote basically says is, we need to quit killing things that want to live and growing things that want to die. <laughs> Like, yeah, we do. We want it like Dane the Lion. We, we're we just bound and determined to wipe that plant off the face of the planet. But it's like, nope, you ain't doing away with me. And thank God, right? Oh, yeah. Like, and, and you know, so, so it's like, you know, so many people try and grow plants that don't actually want to grow and live because they're genetically weak. Right. They're ill-suited to their environment. So then, like, they're constantly having to spend money on chemicals or this, that, or the mm-hmm. other to keep these plants alive. And at the same time, they're killing off all of these plants that want to live and that, you know, don't need the chemicals and do fabulous all by them, you know, by themselves. Yeah. Well, so, Indiana just uh, passed a law here, I don't know, a couple months ago and just outlawed a whole bunch of plants. Like, you cannot, you know, grow these certain plants anymore. And it was just an amazing list, like autumn olive was on the list, you know, white mulberry on the list. It just blows my mind, you know, <laughs> that you can't plant these some of these things. There's a whole bunch, and they, you know, considered invasive in things, but you know, invasive, and they are in certain in certain areas in certain ways. But you know, they're absolutely useful plants as well. Yeah, they will, and it's just like you know, what is is the government of Indiana going to find the the tornadoes and windstorms that carry plants <laughs> from county to county? You know, like it's um, yeah. Well, and, and what really gets me about the invasive species issue is what's really driving a lot of the invasive species problem, in my opinion, is our ecosystems lack large-scale ruminant pressure. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, because, like, every time I look at the woods around my farm and, you know, any time I travel and, I you know, I drive places and, and I look especially at, like, our woodland stuff, like you have to realize that a, a modern woodland does not resemble woodlands from a hundred, you know, twenty or so years ago. Right. Because you used to have large scale herds of, you know, heavy ruminant animals basically moving through and obliterating these now overran with invasive species understories. Yep. You know, so you think about, like, the honeysuckle problem and a number mm-hmm. of these other, you know, viney invasive species in woodland. Mm-hmm. You know, they're there because there's not pigs there, and there's not bison there, and there's not goats there. And there's even less of the things that are there, like deer and rabbits and things like that that would eat some of that stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, like, you, you know, maybe in, you know, another one of my favorite quotes, I believe it's by Wendell Berry. But Wendell Berry says that modern people specialize in taking one elegant solution and turning it into two intractable problems. (laughs) Sounds like something Wendell Berry would say, yes. (laughs) Um, So I think that's him. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, So, because I doubt I could ever come up with something that clever. (laughs) Um, but, But like, but it's so true because it's just like, you know, there would be one elegant solution to dealing with a lot of invasive species problems in terms mm-hmm. of plants. It would be encouraging people to going back to using woodlands and other areas to raise animals. Like, yeah. and, and, and you would severely knock back the invasive species while providing meat and dairy and bacon and, you know, and like food. Yeah. Um, it's like, it's like, Everything eats mulberry. I mean, you know, you get a bunch of small mulberry trees popping up here and there, and you turn anything loose through that, and it's going to just demolish a mulberry tree. It'll eat the leaves, it'll eat the wood, it'll eat everything. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so it, it just kills me because, you know, governments tend to, you know, make problems worse. Right. Um, because, you, you know, I, I do this with my kids. I'm just like, you can, you can never propose a solution until you truly understand the problem. Right. And very few people understand the problem, which Mm -hmm. is why their solutions just end up creating, you you know, catastrophes. Right. And and the solution usually 
when you got people sitting behind desks trying to come up with solutions that aren't actually out there living it, the solutions are, are always extreme, you know, not simple, um, usually causing harm in other ways, and it just happens over and over and over. It's never you know, very environment, environmentally friendly when they do come up with a solution, usually. It's like a yeah, mosquito I issues. I mean, it's, you know... Instead of trying to increase the dragonfly population, let's just go out and just gas all the mosquitoes and kill everything and just throw the whole ecosystem out of balance to kill a few mosquitoes, oh, you know. Yeah, or, or, or why not build bat houses? Right, yeah. Like, there, there's a really interesting story. I think it was a, of a bear down in Texas whose area was suffering terribly from malaria mm-hmm. um, or some other mosquito-carried disease. And so this mayor um, spent a number of years studying bats and, and, and learning to build, going through multiple iterations of giant bat houses mm-hmm. until he finally cracked building these really awesome bat houses that radically reduced the mosquito population in his area, which basically wiped out the malaria problem in this area. Yeah, but John, you know, bats are scary looking and, and nobody likes us flying around. So, you know, we got to come up with a different solution. <laughs> yeah, I, bats are more attractive to me than politicians. So yeah, I, yeah I, me too. <laughs> you know, and I think maybe I saw you post something about this. You know, it was about some, uh, you know, wildflowers along the state highways and stuff. And, you know, we spend, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of dollars mowing the uh, mediums and the, and the ditches and the, it, you know, where you could plant a low profile flower in these areas, let them grow and benefit the bees and, and just the, the environment in general and save all that money for mowing ditches and, and along sides of the roads and things, you know? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That article is just totally, but it also reminds me of the research that came out of Europe recently where they were radically able to reduce pesticide and insecticide use by planting strips of wildflowers mm-hmm. um, alongside and, and throughout the conventional farms. Again, yeah, take it something that's relatively simple and, uh, you know, benefiting from it. it may, something that makes sense, it's only going to benefit the environment, and yet, in the end, it's, it's you know, it probably didn't cost near as much money as some of the other uh, solutions. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I, I don't know if it was Harvard University or something, but some major university a number of years ago moved to doing organic lawn maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, for for like all of their campus ground. And, you know, like all the naysayers were like, this is going to be so much more expensive, blah, 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 blah. And they ended up saving just buckets of money. Yeah. Um, because it's amazing when you work with an ecosystem rather than against it. Right. Um, and really let the ecosystem do what it's made to do and what it wants to do. I'm going to have to apologize to the listeners tonight because some of them wanted us to talk about weed control. Um, <laughs> and, and, and like, we, we've totally skipped that subject, so I'll have to come back sooner than later if you have yeah, time in your yeah. schedule. Wendy, hey, whatever topic uh, you ever want to talk about and where you feel like it's on your mind, we'll talk about it because it's all good stuff. And, you know, we, we like all these topics. You know, homesteaders just like it all. We like to hear about every little thing, every little aspect. And elderberry is fascinating to me, I guess, mostly just because I planted some this year and I'm really wanting to learn a lot more about it. But, you know, there's just a, there's a, a million topics we could definitely talk about for sure. Yeah, well, and the elderberry, you know, like um, what's fun, especially depending on the age of your kids, is you can make flutes, you can make blow guns, you can make whistles, minute, you can make what? pop guns. Really? Um, oh, oh, yeah, like it's... Um, they have a hollow they, uh, yeah, well, they, or something? Well, well, it's not hollow. Elders are filled with a material called pith. Okay. Um, okay. And, and the pith removes very easily. Ah. Um, so again, the, the earliest, you know, the, the, the sand boo, um, is related to wind. It's also the root word in a number of languages for flute. You know, I kind of remember this from a kid. I remember cutting some open when I was a kid and it's almost like a, almost like a styrofoam in the middle and you push it out. I remember doing that as a kid yep. now that you're talking about that. Yeah. And, and, but, but all the, everyone from, um, you know, plenty in Roman times, to call pepper in early America, comment on 
that every school age boy knows that you make the best blow guns and pop guns out of an elder tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll so, have to so, definitely do some experimenting with this. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. So, so there, there's at least, you know, two and a half thousand ish years of history um, where, where people have been like, I can really annoy my sister with this yeah, tree. <laughs> so your kids know about this because they're probably, you got to watch your step around there, right? They're probably shooting you with stuff. <laughs> yeah, not, well, thankfully, you know, that, that, well, and that's where I lost John right there at the end of the interview. We had a few more minutes where we talked about some stuff, but yeah, we, uh, for some reason, my recording cut off right there at the end. So, um, appreciate you coming on to John and, uh, and, uh, definitely get that link to your book in the show notes where you can pre-order it. Uh, you can pre-order that directly from, from the link I'll provide for you from John. And also, if you just want, you can go on Amazon and search for it and you can pre-order it there as well. So, uh, definitely, uh, check that out because John's just got a lot of information um, about elderberry and check out his uh, frugal homesteader book that's a great book i have that one right here on the shelf behind me and it's just a really really good uh, book uh let's just jump right into our homestead recipe of the week this week's recipe comes in from sam at lupine wood rabbitry in alexander north carolina and she has an awesome fermented drink recipe for us so check this out take it away sam Hey, Harold. This is Sam over at Lupine Wood Rabbitry. Uh, we're out in Western North Carolina, just north of Asheville. Uh, today I have an awesome fermented drink recipe for you guys. It is called Tapachi. It is a native Mexican drink. Uh, it's perfect for anyone who's looking to get into fermentation. It's very, very simple. Um, so here we go. You're going to take a one-gallon ball jar. Um, you're going to need the rind of one whole pineapple. Uh, a little bit of skin, a little bit of meat is fine, but mostly you just want the, the skins with all that good uh, natural yeast on there. Um, you're going to take one cinnamon stick, uh, four to five whole cloves, uh, one cup of organic sugar. I like to use turbinado sugar. Um, one inch chunk of ginger or really uh, however much ginger you like. I like it spicy. And to that I add a half a jalapeno that's chopped up. Uh, so you're going to add all the ingredients to the jar, and you're going to fill it with uh, water. Tap water is fine. Uh, you could use filtered water if you prefer. Um, probably about two inches below the, ma the uh, mouth of the jar, just so the fermentation doesn't cause an explosion. Um, I like to take glass ferment uh, fermenting weights and weigh everything down so that everything's below the surface of the water. Uh, you can easily take a plastic Ziploc bag, fill it with water, rest it on top. Uh, you just don't want anything popping out over the surface to avoid any uh, bacteria and, you know, mold growth. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to finger tighten the, the lid on the jar. And what that is, you're just placing the seal over and then uh, just tightening the bend just with one hand. You're not going to put any real pressure on it. You still want that air to be able to escape, but you don't want anything to come in. Uh, some people actually just will tie a cheesecloth around the top, up to you. I just like to keep it a little bit more sealed off. Uh, you're going to put that in a place that's warm, not too hot, not too cold. You really want that fermentation to start immediately. With the, um, with the yeast on the skin of the pineapple, it should start immediately when it hits that sugar. So go ahead and, you know, give it a good stir if you'd like before you peel everything off. Um, this generally takes about two to three days, depending on your climate. Um, out here in Western North Carolina, it's a little chillier because of the mountains. So I give it like two to three days. Um, on day two, you should see a good amount of bubbling and activity in there. Just so you know, everything is starting to ferment and that sugar is being eaten up. After three days, open it up. It should give you a little bit of a fizz and it should start bubbling as soon as you open it, much like a soda would bubble. So that's that natural fermentation process. You've got uh, a natural carbonation. Uh, so you strain that out, and you are good to go. You throw that in a flip-top uh, bottle so you can get that carbonation up even more and stick it in the fridge. I give that another couple days. Usually you don't even have to. You can just drink it right, uh, right away. Um, delicious, super refreshing drink. Um, if you're getting crazy, throw a little tequila in there. You've got a, you got a party. And that's about it. So thanks so much. I hope you guys enjoy it. Have a great day. 
If you want to send in an audio recording of some of your favorite homestead recipes, I would love to have it and and put it on the podcast. And here's how you might do that. Most cell phones usually have a recording app installed in them already just for like voice recording. Uh, Just uh, open that up. Say this is your name. And if you have a website or a Facebook page or a homestead name that that you want to uh, share with us, that's fine. You don't have to. And um, just say a recipe I like and want to share with you today is, and let us have it. Try to keep that recording under five minutes. And, and remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. And when you're done recording and satisfied with how it sounds, just email it to me at sthomestead at gmail.com. And uh, I'll add it to a future episode. I'm really looking forward to all those great recipes we're going to get from you guys. i uh, got a couple more in the queue right now. But, uh, yeah, definitely can use more. So, also, if you have a website or Facebook page for your homestead, I'd, I'll, I would love to add a link to it in the show notes if you have that. So, you can just send that along with your recording. But we love getting those recipes. So, keep them coming, folks. Really appreciate that. Sam, great, uh, great recipe for us this week. Thank you. If you want to submit a question for the podcast, uh, you can do that by uh, calling or texting in your questions to our voicemail at 765-203-1949, and you can submit questions as often as you like. You can also email those in at ask at smalltownhomestead.com. And, uh, yeah, just and just make sure if you're calling or texting that in, uh, I get your name because uh, a lot of times folks will send a text message to that voicemail number, but they won't tell me who it's from. They'll just give me the question straight out. So always make sure all I get is your phone number. I don't get your name when you do that. So always include your name when you do that. And we'll get you we'll, – we'll try to answer that question on the podcast. Or sometimes it's a – sometimes if it's a real simple like yes or no or a, like a one-sentence answer or whatever, I'll just reply back to you. Um, and we won't make that on the podcast, but, um, yeah, I'd love to, uh, love to answer a bunch of questions. Maybe do a whole episode here real soon of just of Q and a again, we ain't done one of those in a while. So, uh, get those questions into me. This podcast is made possible by those who join our homestead forum membership community. Appreciate all of you who are members of that community. And if you want to know more about the benefits of membership, just go to smalltownhomestead.com and click on membership up in the menu there. And uh, we also appreciate those who shop through Amazon using our affiliate link. We There's quite a few of you that do that. I really appreciate it. And also, I don't want to forget those of you who just share this podcast with others. So many of you just tell your friends and your family about this podcast, and they come over and check it out, and they join the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, and we just build this uh, community that's really, really uh, great. So I appreciate all of you who share uh, this podcast with others and leave reviews on Apple Podcasts and other places. I really appreciate that. It's really encouraging, and I thank you so much for that. The show notes for this episode can be found at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 124. And folks, I really appreciate you listening today. And until next time, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.